welcome, ladies, gentlemen, and the freaking sanguinor to that six plus 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 show. I am your host, Tom, and I am over the moon because I've got one of my favorite people in 40k back on to talk about one of the best known, best loved, most played, uh, perhaps not best played armies in 40k, but one that you are always going to see out there and about. Um, and it is, of course, the wonderful Innes Wilson. Innes, how are you doing, man? I am doing fantastic, Tom. Thank you so much for having me here today. It's a cold Monday morning. I like to give anything. I would love, like to be doing more talking about Space Marines. <laughs> no, I'm glad. Glad to have you. It's been a while. Like we had you on for GSC. It was one of my favorite ever episodes that we did, um, and definitely helped me out a lot with the, with the end of Ninth Edition. So really excited to get your kind of insights here on the Space Marines. Obviously, you know one of the main armies that you've played over the last few years. Um, so today, obviously, yeah, you know, there's a ton to talk about with Space Marines. So we've got some very we've got a nice structure we've got a nice plan um there's a bunch of different avenues we're going into so for those who are interested in you know blood angels space wolves dark angels obviously we're going to have to touch on that because spoilers competitively that's where a lot of the flavor and interest is for marines right now um and it's also sort of a a symptom of the way that the detachments and the armies work in this edition as well. Um, but before we get into the Adeptus Astartes, um, I've got a little question. Obviously, if people people know you very well, but just give them give them the basics on on who you are and what you're about first, and then I've got a couple of questions for for some lore, sure. some backstory. <laughs> so um, yeah, my name's Dennis Wilson. I have been playing 40k since I was about 12 years old, so about 15 years now. Mm-hmm. Um, I got my start competitively around about the end of 7th edition, sort of like towards, uh, sort of the beginning of 7th edition, before everything went completely off the rails, like before <laughs> Warcon and stuff like that. And I kind of, because I was invested in it, I just kind of rode the lightning all the way through to the end of that one, enjoying it the whole time, because I never <laughs> fell off the treadmill. So as long as you were staying up to date with it, you never tried to like learn it for fresh. That edition was fine. Um, <laughs> and I got into it competitively, and then I kind of got dragged into the Team Scotland um, ecosystem there, because it's a small community in Scotland. There's, you know, 50, 60 players that are like regularly attending tournaments, more than that, obviously, in general. But, um, you know, once you're doing well enough, you kind of get, you know, you're like, hey, you're going to come off to this little meeting in this little tur- this little tournament venue. And we're going to have a chat about future. Um, so that happened within, you know, sort of like a year of playing competitively. And then it just kind of stuck with that since. I've been doing Team Scotland since 20, uh, 2017 is the first year I coached. Mm-hmm. And I've been playing since then. Uh, I took over his captaincy in 2020 something, some somewhere during the pandemic. No one yeah. will ever know. I could put a <laughs> date on it if you had had me at gunpoint. Um, so yeah, I've been captain Team Scotland since then. Um, and then outside of that, we I have been doing a ton of singles play. I had a podcast called Caledonian Death Watch Radio with one of my hosts up here, uh, Liam Moshe, which was a Scottish focus podcast. I did that for a couple of years, which gave me the opportunity to do a bunch of cool travel and things like that, going out to like the Netherlands and um, going over to there and a bunch of events started in England and cool stuff like that, that then kind of grew into um, like not doing a podcast for a bit because that fell apart. And then I got pulled into Best in Factions podcast network, uh, the Best yes. Build Up network to do 4K Fight Club. Uh, we ran that for six months or so. And then we kind of spun off into our own thing, which then became Stat Check, uh, which has grown like a Hydra. Um, for some <laughs> reason, I, I, we have six shows or something on the network now. Yeah. It's very, a very weird thing to be a part owner of. Um, and then that grew into doing full-time coaching um, because people kept asking and I was like, well, at some point, so I, uh, I started doing it part-time while I was working. I lasted about two months of that, went to LVO, came back and quit my job the same day. I was like, I can't go back to working in an office after going to LVO and yeah. spending all that time hanging out with other people doing this. I was like, I'm just going to try it. And that was 15 months ago. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's been going really well. Um, so yeah, podcasting, Warhammer, like... It's, it's really weird because all the stat check stuff is like my job now. So the coaching, the content creation, all that kind of stuff is the job. And then Team Scotland is my extra job. It's my hobby now. So yeah. I kind of, there's a nice like marked separation there where I have all of the, the Warhammer that is Warhammer. And then I have all the Warhammer that is administrating a herd of cats to go to WTC every year. <laughs> that feel like two separate hobbies sometimes, which is nice. Yeah. Because um, it keeps that like work-life balance. Technically, like hang tenuously by a thread, but it's still there. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you're an all-in kind of person, and that's one of the things I love about you. Know, so I I imagine finding ways to compartmentalize it now must be key to kind of getting by and, and continuing to have all those different plates. Yeah, if anybody figures out even a slight approach that would work for ah. that, I would love to hear. I have no help for you either. I'm no. afraid. I got, I I got, I got no idea. Kind of this way. <laughs> a kind of beautiful madness, and you just run through it, right? Like a big, big daydream. Um, okay, so I've got I've got a few questions for you personally because I, I know I know your kind of main story well, but I have a few in, like little little tidbits I'm interested in getting I guess and I guess adaptation is probably the theme right I think one for me is like obviously yeah you, you kind of got into the international scene from quite an early stage and I guess for you as a, as a person and player 
what was the kind of process of adapting to that universe like? What kinds of things does it take to sort of step from being a sort of local or national player into being one who's got who's in that kind of WTC orbit and thinking about that more? It's really weird because I I have a very like privileged position in that I never really had to. Um, okay, interesting. I oh, I learned being a team player almost more than I learned being a singles player. Like, okay, I walked into it. I was not the best player in Scotland. I was a competent seventh or eighth slot that was like yep. you know I got pulled in when we had players like Matt Edmonds and uh, Neil Powell and Aidan and Bernard Lee that were both playing they were all playing in Scotland that were doing very well down south and I was you know going three and two and four and one at these Scottish tournaments and like I would win an RTT here and there and I would maybe I would play the final table of almost all the tournaments and that was like kind of where I was at for a mm. long time um and I never really broke through into doing like really well singles wise until after I had come third at WTC been at WTC for years it was really after like I did well at like singles events before the pandemic like you know I would come down to England I would go four and one or whatever right I'd play the final table against Mike Moore and get smacked <laughs> on stream you know all that good stuff all, <laughs> all the that things that everybody stuff. does yeah um but after the pandemic it kind of there was a little bit of a because I stayed up to date and kept you know playing and being involved in the community during that time a lot of mm. people stepped away from the game a lot during that and it gave people who like it was one of those like litmus tests where if you were invested and you stayed invested during that time you came back you were going to be better mm. and i came back and i was better than a lot of people because i had stayed invested at that time and then i won my first super major and then i won a second one and then i won a third one and then it's been a while but i won a third one <laughs> <laughs> i say that it's, all, it's only been like a year i can, I can yeah, yeah, yeah 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 absolutely um, <laughs> but no i very much i came into it like i learned to play for the team to you know scrape and grind for a 10 10 11 9 in a in a game and then i learned to be a singles player after that once it became That's amazing yeah once it became like possible and when i when i had time for it as well like i mm. when i was pre i was i was at university and working and now i then i was just working and i had my weekends back because i wasn't working retail and then so i could do you know i think i did 35 tournaments the first year after covid like including RTTs and things like that. So you wow. know, not every weekend, but you know, two like three and four weekends, three and five weekends, I was at a tournament. Whereas before it was I took holidays to go to twelve tournaments a year. Yeah. Um, so very much it was just a matter of circumstance for me that I got it at the right time, mm. right after COVID, and I hit my stride. Plus my books were good. I had Marines and Nids to run yes. off both of. And you know, there's always there's always a component of luck to these kinds of things. Of course. No, completely. It's funny you mentioned Matt Edmonds, because I hit him round one at an RTT local to me recently. And I, I was like, this guy's pretty good for round one of an RTT. <laughs> <laughs> I have like, no, a... no idea who this guy is. Yeah, yeah no, I've, uh, I've never heard of on, this guy. He was um back in the day, back in uh for anybody who has been around for a while, if you remember like rankings HQ. Um, like really back in the day, back when Josh was still the best player in the country in like yeah. 2008, like Matt Edmonds was up there at the time. Wow. Like alongside him. So. Yeah. No, that was it. It was it was that kind of polished, but not polished. Like I don't think he's played as much in recent times, but yeah. it was like, but you just all of the raw basic, you know, understandings and fundamentals were so were so tight and so obvious. And we had a really good, interesting game. That's really cool. Um and yeah, as you said, I, th I think it's actually interesting going the other way almost from teams into singles, because I feel like that tingles that that team's skill set actually sets you up incredibly well to understand with an engage in singles once you've got it. Um, but but acquiring it is quite a strange thing when you're just used to doing your thing and playing your army and bashing into whatever, right? And not I'm just focusing on winning games. Um, so yeah, really, really interesting. My other question is is more of a, re a recent team, Scott, and things. Obviously, you're going through, I think, what's fair to call a sort of process of adaptation. You've had changes in the lineup and other other different things. And I, I would imagine from the position of leadership that you're in, that's presented a whole bunch of challenges as well. So I'm very curious how you're kind of finding that that adaptation and how you've kind of been sort of rallying, I guess, a new, a new set of players and getting things ready for this WTC. Yeah, um, we've, I mean, we've done this now three times because we keep readapting every year. Because it's yeah. not quite second. Give me one second. I'm just gonna no problem. No problem. Who calls a landline in 2024? Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, we've, we've definitely had like a couple of years of this reintroduction stage where coming off of COVID, we lost a bunch of players mm. and we stepped up to the people that were in the local community that were available at the time. And then some of them weren't available the second year. So we readapted, we pulled up Brian Sype, which was a wonderful, wonderful uh, backstabbing when he left me for America this year. <laughs> um, <laughs> so no, it's, it's very much, yeah, it's been a case of, um myself and ricky sims is the only other player that's like returned from the like 2019 2018 rosters um mm -hmm. and we've been just working with that with everybody else to try to bring them up to the level of playing on the world stage and we you know we did 
pretty well last year. Obviously, we had Brian, but we went um, four wins, two losses, and a draw at WP, yeah. which is yeah, it was a great um, show. one of our best performances ever. Yeah, um, we finished like tied with all the teams from sixth through twelfth. And don't worry about the fact that we were the twelfth one because of tiebreakers, <laughs> but sixth through twelfth, we were joint there. Yeah, uh, along with teams like Germany, um, and then. Uh, we've had a couple of rough goes at a few events in the early part of this year with Home Nations and Pirate Cup going mm. a combined two wins, seven losses and a draw. Mm-hmm. But we've had, you know, not had a coach at either of those events. Uh, anybody who knows having a coach at a team event is a massive, it's like, huge. Yeah, adds yeah. a point to every game you play potentially more. Yeah. Um, and we had, we've been, you know, fighting for strength, strength, growing our players. I've got a bunch of new and hungry people that are excited to be going. And it's very much just getting them to the point where they they know that they're not the best players in the room, but also that it doesn't matter that they're not the best players in the room. That you can yes. you can make Liam VSL on the aggregate. That's the yes. you got to moneyball it, right? You got to <laughs> yeah. Not a, but not every team can have Liam VSL, but teams yeah. beat Liam. But teams beat Belgium because yes, they have exactly. players who are better across the board at doing their job. And it's exactly. just finding people who are happy and comfortable on their list, getting them onto it as quickly as I can, and helping them grow within that space which completely you know works well with the skill set that i've got and i'm hoping that we can uh keep pushing that i stepped back from doing a lot of the interpersonal side of the team's gotten stuff so i have a co-captain now um who does all of the administration and mm, um mm. like basically handles the personnel because i'm not particularly great at it um on doing it on that kind of scale mm-hmm. um so i step back from that and just focusing on lists matrices yeah. practice all that kind of yeah. thing so that's where we're working at the moment yeah, it's it's really exciting, as I say, and and in in that process, in that change, there's always a massive opportunity, and new people step up, and and new opportunities, and new sort of talents are found as well. So I think it's one where it's it's going to be really interesting to watch that journey and, and see how it all comes together. Yeah, I'm constantly like side eyeing everybody, like who's going to be my replacement? Who's yeah. going to take the job? Come on, <laughs> yeah. it's going to be you, right? You know That's you it. Got to think about that legacy. <laughs> no, I just I just want to be able to just want to. I can't retire until I repl- until I do better than the third place. That's the problem. I, I've set a very unachievable goal by going third. <laughs> my first year but it's got to be second or first now i can't leave until then. oh I'm it's, putting it so second. dangerous so it's so dangerous oh wow you're gonna be doing a while that's amazing i love it well i'll, I'll be having my fingers crossed for you maybe it'll be this year who knows yeah, we'll I mean, see. it'll be me <laughs> and me looking at being me at jez morris's age with my uh <laughs> of eight-year-olds i trained since birth to come up with breeding a team amazing absolutely amazing <laughs> all right right okay that's enough background for now we're going to get into the space marines um Innis is a consummate professional, so he's given me a ton of notes to work with. We've got a bunch of detail. And so we've got a sort of a nice structure. We're going to be thinking about the different archetypes Marines fall under, melee, shooting, mixed arms, different directions you can take, units that might break through that haven't been necessarily explored as much as they could be yet. And obviously, we're going to cast an eye towards the data slate because, in theory, it's imminent. So hopefully, we'll have a data slate before very long. And with the wide range of units Marines have, obviously, a data slate is always a very interesting time. And it's very reasonable to think that's going to shake Marines up again. So Innes has already got his got his BDI on what, might, what the future might hold. Um, before we get into the kind of nitty-gritty and the analysis... What would you say the kind of overall role and place of Marines in the game typically is? And what's what's the appeal for a competitive player? Why, why get on the Marine train? Sure. So Marines, everybody always talks about Marines as the subscription service army, which is definitely <laughs> true, right? It's the army that you you hand your credit card over to GW and you're like, all right, come on, £300 a month and keep my army up to date. And they will. They'll keep your army up to date. Space Marines are never that bad. Yeah. Um, there's a very real... You know, when people get into the game, they get it with Space Marines. Almost always, they're in all the star boxes. And then people gravitate over to the smaller army that they can finish. Yes. And I think one of the roles that Space Marines do in that is that they keep you always like you've got a hand on the army where if you play, if you buy a Devotan and Votan get nerfed, you don't have you don't have 2,000 points anymore. If you no. buy Marines and Marines get nerfed, you have your troops in HQ still. You so do. you can adapt it to something else. So they're very good at if you want to be a player that's like keeping up at the top of the meta but doesn't want to buy a new 2000 points every time the meta shifts marines are a really good place to start looking and i think that's one of the things that they do best and it's why they're one of the highest represented armies in terms of player population they're always falling between sort of like that i'd say like 10 and 15 percent of the meta so you know roughly one in 10 to one in six players which means that at the course of a given tournament you should probably expect to play marines at least once yeah it's Um, (laughs) whether that's the best version of the list whether that's the you know the literal starter set primaris marines it's entirely up to the luck of the dice yes but they're very good at keeping you flexible and adaptable in a meta that is often very changing and very in flux between balanced data slates new codexes all that kind of thing i don't think there's ever been a time that marines haven't had a build that is I would say like at least, you know, if we put it into the classic like A tier, S tier, B tier, yeah. C tier, like I don't think Marines have ever really been out of like at least low A tier. They've definitely had times where they're not the best option. 
but there's always been something even yeah. in like the eldar period at the beginning of this edition um or some of the times where like basically since we got the like the eighth edition first codex i think marines have been inviable at least since then which means that if you're just looking for something that will keep you close to being viable like you'll always be able to win a tournament with space marines completely that's the the biggest thing and then within that there are some armies that are very flexible some armies that are very not you have world eaters who have less data sheets than i have fingers and then you have <laughs> space marines who have more supplements than i have fingers and <laughs> you have as many you know as many directions as you want to take if you want to try and be smarter than everybody marines have a build for you somewhere in there absolutely um, we've got players in the uk playing firestorm black templars and being the only person doing it and doing very well with it and then we've got people playing all the normal things and just doing the good thing competently and if you want to do the good thing competently or your weird thing that no one else is doing you can do it all within the purview of marines and that has a lot of competitive viability in terms of catching them out by surprise which is always in underrated by everybody that you play against and overrated by yourself yes um, thing you do. you're never actually catching anybody's surprise but <laughs> your opponent will not know how to play into you and it's just how much that matters is always up in flux C completely yeah uh, but marines, marines have it there for you if you want to try and be smart yeah absolutely no that's amazing isn't it and i think it kind of suits their their fluff and their little really tactical flexibility a bunch of different options good at a whole bunch of different things and i think it's fair to say that 10th edition has very much set them up in that style with the changes obviously we've you know we've got indexes for the the kind of uh sort of special special flavors um uh, which which can kind of bleed into and be used across different detachments we've got a codex with a bunch of detachments and baselines as well so let's get the kind of headlines and then we'll start picking into some of the some of the detail. If, if we're going to sort of talk about the overall current competitive state of Marines, factoring in the indexes and the main book, what would your assessment of it be after a ton of games, a ton of analysis? I think Marines are one of the three, if not the best book in the game right now. Um, yep. They are incredibly competitive and viable. They do basically anything you want, like I said. Mm -hmm. And we're in a state in gameplay where I think things are fairly balanced right now in terms yeah. of availability of most books being able to win a tournament mm -hmm. now there are definitely builds that are above rate and things like that but marines are like the meta overall is fairly diverse which means that there are lots of different things that you have to be able to account for in this building you have to be able to plan for indirect guard canoptic court pressure um triple monolith you have elder msu and indirect builds like there's so many different ways to play the game right now that are yes. all working and yeah. marines have a tool set that can take any aspect of that and say okay i want to be good into that yeah and because of that with that level of flexibility you often find that armies like, like i said like world eaters if custodians are popular world eaters probably can't be because yeah. they just don't match up well into that army unless yeah. you are exceptionally more skilled than your opponent and i can't count on that at the, the last rounds of a tournament mm -hmm. where marines if you're really worried about canoptic court you can build a list that has a better than average game plan into canoptic court and Absolutely. you can try to get lucky and pair it or you can play a list that's just really good in general and we can talk a bit about some of the future builds in the future sons of sanguinius that's just <laughs> generally really strong yeah absolutely. Um, but you almost always have that level of flexibility to adapt to whatever is good right now and i think marines are absolutely doing that between probably i would say probably three main builds right now with um, sons of sanguinius gladius x mm -hmm. and um iron sword black templars i think those are kind of the the main ones that are sticking out for me uh, and then like this decided addendum of if you're a psychopath you can play a storm raven uh, and, it will be <laughs> um, and like four people worldwide are doing well with that uh, and power to them but couldn't be me i don't want to pair a hammerhead and just get tabled um, <laughs> <laughs> wonderful okay well let's let's start branching out into some of those subcategories again as, as as you kind of alluded to there's some of the indexes are really really getting helping to get extra juice out of different sort of versions and as you say you've got combat shooting and a real mixed arms flavor as well so let's let's start with what you've termed high melee in your notes i like the name <laughs> high melee that makes me feel good so what what are the kind of branch of options here what are the sort of subcategories and what's what's the appeal and the use of, of sort of a melee focus in marines right now yeah so high melee is a thing that definitely doesn't sound right if you've read the marine codex but not the indexes because there are no <laughs> melee data sheets in the yeah there's marine not codex. you can run a regular assault terminators that get plus one to hit your oath target with their three attack thunder hammers <laughs> but if once you dive diverge out into the supplement chapters there are lots and lots of very high powerful melee units mm -hmm. specifically i've called out three which is sons of sanguinius righteous crusaders and um space rules leaning into Stormlands from the core codex yes um so sons of sanguinius is uh, broadly it's the plus two strength plus one attack on the charge uh chapter which gives you a ton of access to um basically making even codex melee units punch reasonably up um and then it has access to fight on death yes, um and huge. then 
some of the most powerful like baseline data sheets in the game with Death Company, who yes. nearly ruled the hit, which alleviates pressure on Oath of Moment, which is a very core mechanic to Space Marines that has you basically have anger on in the sky pointing down and saying that thing dies. Um, <laughs> you know, much better than having an aura. I don't know why anybody yeah. bothers with auras these days when you can just pick things to die. Um <laughs> So yeah, you have um, Death Company who have native hit rerolls, who have a very reasonable shooting attack, access to fight on death, obviously armor contempt across the board, helps mm -hmm. a ton with survivability for Space Marines. Um, and then, yeah, jump units in general on basically every terrain format right now, even dub, even UKTC, which is notoriously probably the worst for melee staging, yeah. um, jump units can cross the gap and rapid ingress causes a lot of the difference, mm -hmm. um, which makes Sunset Sanguinius very, very capable of dealing, you know, crushing damage to basically anybody, putting OC on objectives and denying your opponent primary um there's very little that it's bad at uh it allies pretty well with things like an assassin um you'll find that basically any list that we talk about for space marines you can probably improve by swapping a scout squad out for a Calix, for a Calix assassin yeah um but if you're not playing with the Calix assassin you want to run a scout squad just anytime i say calamus all fill with scout squad and you'll probably be fine except guard um yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah, it's something it's just very very high pressure it's what i've been playing the most recently i've played it for my last three tournaments mm -hmm. um it, it feels like you're playing ninth edition melee units. That's like yeah. the, the easiest way to describe it. You charge something with a Death Company squad, unless it is a two-up save and armor of contempted and a minus one damage, it will die yeah. if you hit it with a full squad. Um, watching like it, watching that, that unit kill like two Dread Knights in an activation with like three guys and five guys, because I couldn't quite get there everybody, and still having both of them die is a power trip you will feel with few other units. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah absolutely so sun sun's in an incredibly punchy spot having a ton of inferno pistols doesn't hurt either just it does able not, no. it does got a little bit a little bit more shooting kick than it meets the eye when you first first play into it and as you say it just has now now that the strength's a bit higher and i mean to be fair i think it always had game it always had some degree of game it's just that the meta was often a bit too crazy i to notice, think right? um one of my one of my co-hosts on Satchi put it well um the plus one strength didn't make this detachment but it made us look at it yeah exactly, um, exactly. which i think is probably fair <laughs> yeah Absolutely. And so of, of the other melee, melee flavors, obviously Black Templars and the Stormlance Thunderwolves, they are wolf jail. Yep. <laughs> Slightly well, different flavors. <laughs> um, Black Templars Righteous Crusaders is a build that I think is very underplayed because it's a miserable build to like put on the table a yes. little bit where you're playing broadly the core of it is something along the lines of two 20-man bricks of Primaris Crusaders, which are two in models, um, 10 of which are Space Marines, 10 of which are Scouts. Uh, and then you attach one with Grimaldus, who gives them a five up feel on the pain or advance and charge. Um, and then you attach one of them with a character with Tannhauser's Bones, which is an enhancement that gives you a six of no pain, gives you a, a five of no pain as long as you pick the army wide six of no pain, which yeah. weirdly you're probably going to do. Yeah. Um, so you end up with these two very, very durable bricks, which do pretty reasonable damage into the right kinds of target. You can have things like crit fives and lethal and sustained with like changing the vows and Rage Crusaders. And then you back that up with the like incredibly powerful melee unit that is Sword Brethren, who yes. are. Basically, imagine chosen, but instead of advancing charging, they just hit you in the face really, say, really hard. Yeah, real um, chosen energy. <laughs> yeah, they hand out they hand out plus one damage or plus one attack uh, at the start of each fight phase. So when you combine that with something like Hellbrex, who gets um, like damage two sweeps at AP three or um, damage four as main attack, also does more wounds at the start of the charge phase. You combine that with um, a character like a Judicar that gives you fight first to make them very difficult to charge. You put them in Impulsors, you put them in Land Raider Redeemers. Land Raider Redeemer, very powerful data sheet. Depends on terrain format a little bit, but, you know, Tensor Brethren with um, Lamar with uh, Hellbrecht and a character that gives them lethal hits like mm -hmm. a Lieutenant will kill basically anything it touches. You yeah, have so amazing. many attacks with Oath of Moment. The other units don't really require it because they're mostly just hitting you with like AP1 attacks. And then you can back that up with kind of dealer's choice of Marine scoring between jump intercessors, you have Inceptors, you have Scouts, you have um, Inceptors, I think I said those already, uh, Infiltrators. Yeah. Um, like there are so many like little Marine things that you can put in that once you add a feel no pain to them are actually pretty relevant as yes. being like defensive units. People definitely overvalue the marine defensive profile but it is an obnoxious defensive profile sometimes oh um, exactly three up armor save with um, two wounds like um we all know how, how much of a pain it is to kill, like that one war spider exarch that just has that extra wound to be a pain and yes. marines are just doing that army wide yeah um marines definitely die when you try to kill them but they don't die to garbage like, yes very very quickly and in a game where a lot of vehicles have just additional damage output that's kind of garbage. It's very good at killing Eldar. It's very good at killing cultists. Mm. It's not amazing at killing marines. And that helps a ton for just having that one dude stand on an objective and scam to get you five primary. It's exactly. not to block a corner here and there. The number of times you just have like one dude and adding a feel no pain to that 
and adding the leadership five to them so they're less likely to feel Battleshock just keeps you ticking um, yeah. in a way that a lot of armies don't have. Completely. My, my Votan hated Templars. Um, the the Fiona Pain just throws off all that damage too. And, and and you're already in an AP1, AP2 land and armor Kemp and Fiona Pain. You're like, oh no, we have serious problems here. Yeah, that 20 man brick, like I, oh. I had, I played against one of them at uh, an event recently and one of the 20 man bricks tanked like a, an Iron Storm army. And I was just <laughs> like, yeah, I guess that's actually what happens. There. Like it died down to like three dudes. But yeah. it was still just like, I can't believe I just shot like four tanks at this thing <laughs> and charged it, and there's still dudes. Yeah, like, absolutely. This shouldn't be happening. <laughs> Completely. And it's, a, it's got that kind of transport, stagey, chosen style punchiness, but it's got real durability to anchor and force mistakes onto it as well. It does not have shooting. That's the one thing that you yes. do not get that. Happen. You can put in a little bit in the same way that Sons of Sanguinius might bring in like a Lancer or two. You can yes. definitely put some in, but it is not specifically good in that detachment you get you can run it same with sons of Sigourney. you may put in lancers you put in predator destructors the land Raider redeemer has a relevant gun but mm. you are not a shooting army you are definitely going to be the one that is hiding deployment more than your opponent totally um there's also the very skew version which we've seen something like ed watts play uh in the uk recently oh god you yeah. go to like eight or 120 of those primaris crusaders and yeah. just relying on the sense of feel no pain you put hellbrecht into one of those bricks instead of into a sword brother and squad and yeah that's the like the pure board control version of this it still hits very hard don't underestimate it um especially because those primary crusaders ones have scout naturally uh, yes. which they don't get if they're attached to a character so if right. you have like two 20 mans that don't have an attached character they're very good at taking some early early board control early board presence yeah really nice uh, and it's interesting you mentioned the lancer because i wanted to kind of tout that as as a plug-in that works even in all these combat builds right because the lancer's a really flexible little gun tank for keeping people yeah honest. i think the lancer because it has um it has aquiline optics which gives it a reroll to hit wound and damage it's just very it's very consistent in making your opponent take saves. That's as yeah. far as I'll go with it. Yeah. Um, whether they're good at whether your opponent's going to fail them or not is entirely up to them. Yeah. It's just it's an exercise in misery if they just have sixes showing. Yeah. Um, but anything other than that, you know, any vehicle with a three armor save is taking six up against them, even in cover, which is usually enough to kill. You know, you can usually hurt any vehicle in the game. I would, I would usually go with if I fire two lances at something, it'll take eight damage. Yes. And that's basically anything in the game. Yeah, and it might high roll. I've definitely had turns where you know one of them one shots a land raider, the second one one shots the impulsor, and then you Completely. charge the contents of both, and the game ends. And yeah. they're very good for making your opponent have to respect that. Yeah, um, even in an army that doesn't necessarily have a ton of shooting output. Yeah, players. exactly that, and they, and they can operate from a part of the board that when you're playing into a very combat heavy army is is tough to actually reach. They're out also and deal with. very good at leading the charge, which I think Ooh, people underestimate with them. Interesting. Little, you know, okay. Army. You almost always want to lead with your Lancers in these kinds of games if you're ah, not charging things. Okay. Because your Lancers, you're not going to outshoot your opponent. If you're shooting them, they are shooting you back, and your Lancers will die anyway if they're stay, if they're deployed back. So you might as well put them on an objective so your opponent has to deal with them and can't afford to low roll, okay. which, makes them over, which makes them commit in ways that they don't necessarily want to. Because yeah. if I put a Lancer with OC3 on an objective, you can't flip it with just a Rhino. You've got to get the dudes out. Yeah. You, otherwise, because if you don't kill it, I can Armour Condemned. I can smoke screen. I can make. I think it has smoke. I've never smoked with it. You theoretically maybe could. <laughs> um, I'll double check that one. Yeah, we will. Um, <laughs> But you can definitely at least armor content them. You can command reroll a save. Suddenly, your Lancer doesn't die. You're holding that objective. Now, your Lancer is flipping primary without you ever having to commit one of your real units. And Amazing. if they were just going to sit in your deployment zone and get shot anyway, or not shoot, you might as well be pushing agency with them. Yeah, of course. And, and finally, with these melee armies, so much of it is about you going forward, you being yes. the person on the attack. No, that makes complete sense. And they're creating that overload of, of choices and options, right? And then Wolf Jail. And what do you think of Wolf Jail? Right, Wolf Jail is... <laughs> Wolf Jail is a list. It exists. <laughs> I knew, um, I I knew cannot, this would be the response. I cannot personally respect it, but <laughs> I have an intense love of anybody who has enough confidence in themselves to be like, yeah, I'm just going to go first five times. Um, so Paul for anybody James, who doesn't know, he's literally talking to you, Paul, wherever you are. <laughs> um, Stormlance has an incredible suite of stratagems. Mostly it has a reactive move and it has a minus one to hit and wound battle tactic against yep. shooting only. Now, when you combine that with eight-man Thunderwolf squads with six Thunderwolves with a four vulnerable save and four wounds each, and a Wolfguard battle leader who gives them a once per game blood surge ability to move into combat with people, and then a Wolf Lord to give them a free battle tactic so they can spam that minus one to hit or potentially the plus one to wound on the charge strategy. Suddenly, they're very good at getting in your face. It yeah. has turn one rapid ingress options um, or just turn one coming from reserve and run at you. It can move 21 inches and then charge with the stratagem to all advance nine with the possible to advance from the wolf lord it's very good at getting in your face it does not really do damage it's <laughs> no, good it at putting you in a box and going yeah. if you die to ap1 damage two you're you're gonna have a bad time 
And if yeah. you don't die to AP1 damage too, you're going to sit there in your deployment zone for a while. Yeah. And it's very good at doing that. It it plays a lot like um, Chaos Chosen from the previous meta, where okay. it makes the characters hit pretty hard with their Thunder Hammer, their Lightning Claws, whatever, because they get plus one damage. And they do a decent amount of damage, but the units themselves are a little underwhelming. They then fall back and charge, they charge back in, they get their plus one damage again, they hurt mm. you. They are very bad at getting charged because they don't get their plus one damage on the charge or mm. when they're charged, only when they're being offensive. So you definitely want to be careful about giving your opponent too many options. There are armies that can just punch their way out. Blood Angels, um, Guard with 18, with like 15 to 18 Bulgren is difficult. Uh, mm. If you're playing less than that, yeah, you're going to get put in Wolf Jail. Shout out to Nassim who had that happen to him and then just put more Bulgren in his list and was like, oh, I just can't lose this matchup now. <laughs> I think Space Wolves is one of the most binary options if mm. you're in a good matchup and you go first or you're in a like a really good matchup and you go second and it doesn't matter because you can get a good rapid ingress you will just win the game and if you're in a bad matchup there is almost no capacity to play your way out of a hole you are just yeah. data sheeting at people completely um and i think that that when you are trying to go do a deep run at a tournament where you want to be in like a contention for winning it Wolf, like Stormlands isn't a great option but if you just want to try and win as many games as you can and have fun doing it Stormlands is great for that Absolutely. I think it's very and don't get me wrong you definitely can win a GT you can win a major with it because you could just get a good run of matchups anybody yeah, can just get a good run of matchups GSC won a tournament recently yeah um, <laughs> but I wouldn't call it I would say it's the least reliable of any of the marine builds that are like within the sphere of viability right now sort of like to use the colloquial term, like B tier or above. I think mm. Stormlands is like floating around that B tier where it can punch up, it can have a good game here and there. You could win a GT, but you're going to be working against your army to make it happen a lot. Yeah, totally. And it's, I mean, it's classic Space Wars. It does feel very ride or die. And it's, it is it is a bit skew and it's a bit bit more lopsided in its capabilities and its its effect. But yeah, it's, I've certainly seen it out there doing some horrible things. So it's and there is a better version of Stormlands in Gladius. You just play Gladius. Hey, it is okay. just a better list. We'll get to that in a bit. That's yeah, we'll get to that. Is. All right. Well, I think I think that ticks off the combat for now. That's that's obviously, the, to me, that's the most exciting. Now we're going to take it to where my brain slides. I also, for off. what it's worth, think it's the best right now. I think, yeah, I think you're right. I think Sons of Sanguinis is possibly the best army in the game right now That's it's definitely take. it's like it's them or thousand sons or chronoptic core one of the wow three. okay and blood angels is really really good at making games um making games end and <laughs> yeah. like, whenever you play one of those rapid like very heavily like fast rapid ingress based armies um you have such a if I go second, the game is terrifying for you because I'm going to Rapid Ingress and I'm going to be playing with the Squad of Death Company for four turns of the game. Mm. And if you go first, you can often deploy very aggressively with Blood Angels to just take complete control of the midboard and push your opponent so far back that they will never score primary without yeah. being very scared of you. And when you have an army that is that good at going first and going second into almost every matchup, it is very difficult to play around because oh, you have to deploy with enough level of aggression that you can take command of the board if you go first so that you're not completely shut down by the Rapid Ingress, but also deploy aggressively enough that you don't just have to run away from them after you go second if you go second yes. so yeah. it's very very difficult to play against um there it's a lot of you know it's a lot of knife edge any melee army is if you fail yes. a charge you, you just don't do damage yeah um you know there are definitely the capacity for the game to end on a failed three inch charge that you don't have a cp to mm -hmm. reroll because you had to do damage somewhere else or you know things like that which does make it you know it's a vulnerable best army in the game it's not absolutely you know, but it it's definitely up there and I oh, been incredible, incredibly powerful. So yeah, it's ability to answer the range of questions the game actually represents at the moment is, is really, really good. And I say, and it, and it just has so much damage, um, which is always a really, really powerful place to be. Speaking of so much damage, we're going to take it to high shooting next. Okay. This is, this isn't my wheelhouse. I'm not, I'm not a massive fan of the all in shooting builds, but it's fair to say Marines have some real, real shooting potential if you skew hard into that so let, let's talk about what marines are doing with their guns right now that it? that book definitely says do you want to shoot like the core <laughs> codex is do you yeah. want to shoot the index yeah. is or do you want to punch things yeah absolutely. Um, <laughs> and never the two shall meet in a list like apparently it's just illegal uh, the attachments are never good for both of them except maybe gladius um okay there are again i think there are two real ones here and one that's kind of interesting much in the same way that i had stormlance i think there is um iron storm black templars it is just good unfortunately <laughs> yeah, it's it really, really annoying <laughs> um you put somewhere between 9 and 13 of your favorite hulls of space marines on the board yeah. and it will shoot harder than any army in the game yeah that's um, incredible there you're, there is an argument that again thousand suns within 12 will shoot harder and then any other range bracket it is it is iron storm mm. um it definitely it needs line of sight it's it's very 
I have this thing with Arsenal. It's a very fair run at you shooting army. Oh, it, it is. It's very that, honest. It doesn't yeah. like people aren't really running whirlwinds. You know, nope. it's just tanks coming at you, and it's yeah. like, can you answer the tanks? <laughs> yeah. And if you go yes, well, Arsenal will go well. I didn't have a plan B. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it really is. Um, there are definitely some versions of it that will run higher on the scoring, which is the versions that I was playing. Um, you're kind of, to, to very quickly run through it, Iron Storm gives you um, some detachment benefit that doesn't really matter that involves rerolls to hit and wound, um, like one reroll to hit or wound every time you activate. Almost irrelevant. What it gives you is the stratagem called Mercy's Weakness and an aura of advanced shoot and an aura of lethal hits for yeah. vehicles. And that's it. If they didn't have a detachment rule, I think you'd still play Iron Storm almost exactly the same. Yeah. Um, it'd be a little worse for like a couple data sheets, but yeah. really it's about those three abilities. Mercy's Weakness is a stratagem that gives you, if you're targeting a unit that's damaged, um, you get sustained hits, and if it's a vehicle that you are using it on for your unit, it gets sustained hit. It gets critical fives, which wow. then stacks with the lethal hits. Um, so you have things like gladiator reapers, gladiator valiants, um, predators, whirlwinds. Frankly, anything that has a shooting profile mm. is massively improved by going oath of moment, mercy's weakness on you, remove your unit. Yeah. Um, and there are not a lot of things that that won't kill. You're mm. talking like. 12 devastating wounds on average out of a gradient reaper that targets an infantry unit without stratagem because it has sustained its two and full rerolls. You can just chase fives with plus one from a tech marine. Um, you know, you'll pick up most of a Bulgarian squad from like a six man. And that's just something not a lot of armies can sustain. It's no. pretty terrifying on Overwatch because it can't yeah. sustain its two there. Oh, you it is. Gladiator yeah. Lancers, you have Predators, Gladiator Valiants in sort of like the um the Team England build recently. It it really doesn't matter what vehicles you run. I think that's one of the like the weirder open secrets of Iron Storm is that it really does just kind of pick your favorite eight to eight to thir eight to thirteen and then decide if you want scoring on top of it. Yeah. The only one that's like I think mandatory, you will probably see two or three gladiator reapers in every build because yeah. they're just the best on rate data sheet. It's just and the you sheer will volume, usually isn't it? at the yeah. moment see the Eliminator Impulsor because rules of use <laughs> is fun and we all enjoy doing it. Yeah. And we all feel really smart when we're explaining it to our opponents. <laughs> um, which is to say you can run an impulsor and uh, six eliminators with um, the instigator bull carbines that allows them to fire and then uh, re-embark in the transport, which then means they can disembark after the impulsor moves, before it moves, whatever, fire their guns and then re-embark in the impulsor and then the impulsor has firing dick six, fire the guns again. Amazing. It's stupid. It's the only points upgrade war gear in the game right now. That's how I describe it. You can it's pay 75 points and add, funny add thing. eight last cannons to your yeah. eight last cannons <laughs> to your impulsor. It's really funny. It gives you really good scoring in the late game. I would probably run like one squad in an impulsor, even if it didn't work like that. But mm. the fact that it does makes it very easy. Um, that unit, because it has fire and fade, it can disembark after the impulsor moves, disembark after the impulsor advances. You can buff the impulsor as it's a vehicle. Um, I've, I've had that thing one shot, you know, anything up to it, including land raiders. Mm. Just between the like the the um, eight last cannon shots with lethal hits, sustained hits, um, ultimate the moment, all that good stuff. It, it's just incredible damage output. Absolutely. Um, and then you have kind of, do you want scoring? There are a lot of options for the scoring components in there. Um, we've seen uh, the traditional is probably like rhinos full of crusaders, like the Black Templars infantry guys. They just come with multi meltas and a uh, melt gun and a inferno pistol for 75 points of OC2 and a transport. Um, so I was running like four squads of them inside two rhinos just for firing decking multi meltas and driving about and stealing objectives. Made the custodies match up very fun because they could very rarely hide 10 OC on an objective. Um, so you just <laughs> dump crusaders on it and be like, are you going to come out and kill them? Cool, die now. Um, you can definitely go down the route of things like infiltrators to hold your backfield a little more aggressively. I was playing a whirlwind, so less important. Um, there's also things like uh, one of the ones that's been growing in popularity is the incursors in an impulsor. Mm -hmm. uh, the incursors natu naturally have scout, which confers to the impulsor, so it's quite good at getting up the board. You're ah. playing black templars, so um, all of your like um, primaris vehicles have a free multi melt attached. So that squad has you know you can run it with the um, the Bellicotus missile and the multi melter. It's got like a reasonable amount of forward pressure damage. You can go like 18 inches forward on turn one with the scout move. And then the incursors themselves have, um, they basically point at a unit and go plus one to hit against it. So oh, they're nice. quite good for just giving you like that little burst of extra damage output against something that isn't oath necessarily, mm. um, which can help you get some damage up. But they're also, you know, a grenade unit that can get out the board to proc um, damage on something for Mercy's weakness because you have to pre damage in order to use that stratagem. So there's like, there's a little bit of gameplay there. Mm -hmm. um we've seen things like hellblasters and furnace marines inside impulses as well to take use of firing deck mm -hmm. like there's lots of the detachment is kind of just throw a dartboard at your favorite marine vehicles and scoring units and you'll build a competent list it's hard yeah. to get it wrong with iron storm um, nice. because it's just giving you good stuff i mm -hmm. think it's 
it's definitely the training wheels space marine army it doesn't require a ton out of you you're just going to shoot things and score some points mm. um it can be a little bit vulnerable to getting trapped in this deployment zone you know you go second against something like um you know a very heavy scout moving army like world eaters you're going to be deploying very far back you don't have a ton of carrier melee you can definitely add some in i've seen versions with sword brother and hellwrecked all that kind of thing but it's definitely struggling on that um if you want to go down the Redemptors route, there's a different list that's similar to this. Don't mm. play Redemptors in Black Temple's Iron Storm. It is not worth it. You will probably not have a great time. <laughs> um, I maybe I could I could see it. Like we tried them a bunch at the beginning. I think everybody saw the um, like Triple War One, Triple Redemptors when the Space Marine Codex dropped. Yes. everybody was playing that for a while, and it very quickly dropped off. Obviously, yeah, it, did, it didn't really hit the heights, did it? I've both yeah. gone off. Have both gone off in points since then. Redemptors are still a fine data sheet, but just don't expect them to like they're. Damage by committee, I think, is the way I describe Redemptors. And Ironstorm usually works best when it's just independent data sheets doing a thing, getting yeah. like increased to greater heights by abilities. Where Redemptors are not amazing shooting, not amazing fighting, a little bit of everything. The yeah. Ironstorm is sometimes doesn't necessarily need. They're also quite awkward to move a lot of the time because they they're are. a little bit slow. Um, and they, you know, they have to charge to get to do damage, which means getting around terrain can be a little awkward. Hmm. Okay, so that's the Iron Storm. Are there any other kind of shooting builds of note at the moment? So there's another Iron Storm build. Oh, good. That, that okay, just sweet. Has a second build. That's Let's keep viable, it rolling. Yeah. Which is Lion Storm, I think is the, the colloquial term. <laughs> right? oh, which is yeah. okay. the version that's running. Um, basically, Dark Angels dropped as a codex and ceased to exist in the it mentality is. of basically everybody, except for two data sheets that remain completely amazing, which is Azrael and the Dark Shroud. Okay. Um, Azrael gives you a CP in the command phase, and he is a dude that can stand on an objective with a four vulnerable save, has a like damage to any infantry four plus strength eight gun and a devastating wounds combat like he backfields pretty well mm -hmm. um for like holding your home objective and stopping people like taking it off you um like you'll mess up some more spiders like you'll lose the primary but you're getting it back <laughs> yeah. um and the dark shroud kicks out a six inch aura of stealth and cover to everything just okay all things 125 points nice. it's yeah. also a 14 inch move land speeder in an addition where all the land speeders died and went oh sorry went to the farm but the land speeder <laughs> dark shroud is here carrying on the legacy of last edition um <laughs> by being a 14 inch move model in an army that is generally pretty slow yeah and then you abuse that by stacking buffs on stupid data sheets like redemptors and storm ravens yeah um the storm raven is point for point the best unit you can use mercy's weakness on it has a it has two hurricane bolters for 24 shots with twin linked it has a twin link multi melter a twin link plasma cannon and two missiles on top of that and you you might see um like some other things on top of that like you might see the last cannon instead of some of the like whatever right ton of shooting it's fast it's movement 20 when it's in hover mode uh, it has a transport capacity for a redemptor dreadnought which means you can put it inside it and then drive the storm raven 20 inches forward and get a redemptor out the front of it and shoot things with the redemptor uh they're all five of those vehicles are minus one damage and in cover and stealth you will probably run an enhancement called adept of the codex which gives you a once per battle round blank a damage after failing a save yeah, that'll, that'll do which it. just makes all of this stuff incredibly durable you have a ton of CP. Um, you can get just because as Azrael funds you with CP every turn, your armor attempting, your mercy's weaknessing, your grenade stratting, and then you're running things like scouts, jump intercessors that can go inside the transports and just give you grenade strat and mortal wounds up the front. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's a good list. It's mostly, I would say, making waves in um, the GW um, terrain meta with players like Kitsmith Hannah playing it because it has, um, the Storm Raven has very real movement issues because it's a flyer. It, um, has to like move in awkward angles and pivot and things like that because if you put it in hover mode it measures to the hull um yes. you have to like move the wings around terrain and all that kind of thing right. on wtc boards and on uktc boards it can struggle for deployment space it can struggle yeah. for land places wtc has some additional requirements with like it not being able to overlap buildings because they're treated as infinitely tall so it can be a little awkward it's definitely playable but not perfect on if you're playing on gw train for any reason and there are definitely vets in the uk that play gw train and things like that mm -hmm. um it is phenomenal there is deployment mm -hmm. space you have like that 12 by 12 ruin in your back corner you can put two storm ravens in there and hide them all game or you can just put them the, on the line and be like well there's nowhere to hide because gw boards are fairly open firing lanes in the midboard very very confident we've seen players like kitsmith hannah crushing people with them i think yeah, one absolutely might open or something like that with it mm -hmm. um just very very good list very very strong i think it's a little binary um it yeah. does one thing very well it's durable toughness 10 hulls with minus one damage if you can deal with that um you're going to then you're going to have a bad time as the person on the receiving end if you just can't kill your opponent you can't get to them 
you know, there are there are matchups that are tough. It also like doesn't have an invulnerable save, which makes the thousands of the matchup unpleasant. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. Yes, it does. Yeah. So that's I think I think for the Iron Storm stuff, it the, the overall feel I've had playing into it and seeing it out there is that, as you say, it's it's quite honest. It, it it's very potent at what it does, but it you know what it's gonna do, and it does have a certain set of weaknesses and vulnerabilities. But as soon as it hits a straight shootout, it's just gonna absolutely yeah. clean up every time. I would say playing Iron Storm across like I think I played Ironstorm for like four or five tournaments. The only game I ever played that I didn't feel like I was competitive was playing against MSU Eldar because I just couldn't catch it all. I think yeah. I killed like five units a turn for five turns and then you ended with like you ended with three units, but they were all on three objectives and denying me five primary. Yes. And I'm just like, I don't understand how <laughs> I've killed everything, but I can't score points. Bim bam and boozled, Ironstorm is yeah. very, very vulnerable to that. <laughs> Outside of that, the games with it are like quite clean um yeah absolutely. often the games will be very much i have shoved 10 tanks at you can you deal with this and the other opponent goes no and you go cool so remove your models now and yeah. it's not it's not the most interesting play style it's definitely <laughs> one of the lists that i think the game would be better if it wasn't a good build yeah it um, feels probably the most likely to be in the i mean we'll get to it but it feels most likely to be in the targets right i think for, i would imagine changes. i also think at some point that eliminator combo should just die that would be really <laughs> nice if that just went away yeah we'll see the how last, word of mouth gets on the last right. like high shooting build i want to touch uh -huh. on is probably um one that everybody's aware of which is the vanguard marines that uh, John oh, yeah. created WCW. Yeah, yeah. um that build is definitely a high shooting build um it does have you know some melee units and things like that with Calgar, uh, but that build moved has generally moved away from running the aggressor brick into running an erratic air brick for points reasons because that, the erratic air unit went up forty points mm. and inceptors went up twenty points per three, um, and that list is playing you know somewhere in the region of like twelve to fifteen inceptors and an erratic air brick, um, and then you have the devastator centurions with um, Uppy Downy from Ural Ventress, and it's the only build that I would say is like a core space marine build like it plays the marine codex yes. as it stands. Um, it is. Very good in the right hands, but very vulnerable to making small mistakes, which Completely. I think is a reason that we don't see it a ton, mm -hmm. is that if you are not going to play that list like John Lennon, you're probably not going to get John Lennon level results out of it, yeah. <laughs> which is to say you are going to be playing very carefully around edges and shooting people and abusing your minus one to hit and minus one wound, uh, minus and cover to take mm -hmm. exactly the right amount of no damage while nuking things with the Devastator Centurions every turn while getting yeah. CP out of Calgar uh, and controlling poor space with the Eradicators and the threat of Inceptors. Completely. Um, if you make mistakes with that build and you try to drop in, you drop inceptors in the wrong place and they die. You put your centurions in the wrong place and they get charged, or not even charged. If somebody gets within three inches of them, then that unit turns offline because they can't go back into reserve because they have to be outside three. Okay. Um, it's very, very vulnerable to very small mistake going wrong for it. And if you are a player who is vulnerable to getting aggressed at and getting pressured, then it is you know it's a, a list that is likely to you are going to slip up with it. But it is an unreasonable amount of shooting for that that one turn it's like so that turn killing. two of shooting it will kill whatever it needs to and yeah. if it can make if you can make the game stick with that if your target part is right if you played the early game in a way to make your opponent expose the assets you needed to so much of these kind of space ring builds are because you're so good at killing exactly one thing with oath the moment a lot of the game plan that you're trying to do is restrict your opponent's options by either controlling space or killing their small units that yep. they have to start using the things you need to kill so that you are getting value out of your ultimate moment. If your ultimate moment is going on the scout squad that you know yeah. is going to kill, but you can commit a little less to it, that's fine. But what you want to be doing is if there's three or four important units in your army, is making your opponent play in such a way that they give you one of them a turn to yeah. deal with because they have to, because you are controlling their gameplay to the point where they can't avoid it. Completely. Um, and that's what Vanguard is really, really good at yes. if you're an expert with Vanguard. Yes, yeah, it's very cerebral. It's very punishing. I've played into it with with very sort of meat and potatoes armies like Votan, and you're like, I just cannot cannot lay a glove on this thing when it's played well. Like it's just I'm being danced around and picked off. But as you say, it's got that House of Cards feeling that it's it a lot of its play is tied up in a couple of things. If they get locked down or damaged, then it it falls away very quickly. Yeah, exactly. It's just. If you're not John Lennon or Brody Middleton out in Australia, I've just not seen people getting results with it, really. Yeah. There have been a few people doing fine with it, I think is the... But nobody's really been hitting the same heights. It obviously got nerfed from WCW, but we all saw it on stream against Manny and doing like incredible things in the in the finals and semifinals. So it's it's a build that I would definitely keep an eye on going into the balance state. Like, I think it's the one that nobody nobody's playing it right now and it's yeah. it's not really good so amazing okay right well we're going to take it towards mixed arms um because marines certainly do that very well and they've <laughs> always been touted in that way so what, what are the kind of mixed arms options if you want to mix it up between the shooting yeah. and the combat? um i think mixed arms is it's not a misnomer for marines because gladius is just a wild detachment um it's one of the <sighs> gladius is one of the best designed detachments that just exists i think yeah. there is very little i can say about it that isn't it does almost everything reasonably competently and if you're willing to spend resources it can make anything sing 
Yeah. You can increase your shooting. You can increase your melee. You can make your units more flexible. You can make them more durable. You can do basically anything once or if you're willing to spend CP. Yeah. And that's really, really powerful in the hands mm-hmm. of somebody who is flexible and adaptable and willing to adapt to a change in game state mm-hmm. and to make the most out of it. It's an incredible tool set. Mm-hmm. It also makes every other attachment look boring by comparison. <laughs> it does. My biggest, like crime for the marine book is the gladius yes. the one that we got given in the index yes. is that once gladius we got gladius and then i looked at everyone and i was like well, yeah but these are all just like side grades at best <laughs> none of these are like yeah none of these make the list more interesting right completely um so gladius has uh for anybody who doesn't know for some reason yeah the three <laughs> the three states of once per game advance and charge once per game fall back and shoot and charge and once per game uh, advance and shoot and then it has three stratagems that are key to those um, for plus one, uh, ignore cover and plus one AP if you're in Devastator Doctrine, which is the advanced shoot one, Lance and plus one AP if you're in Assault Doctrine, which is the advanced and charge one. And then um, you, you have a reactive move stratagem that becomes flat six inches if you are in uh, the fallback and shoot doctrine. Yes. Um, which gives you a ton of tactical flexibility. You then have armor contempt. You have put a unit into any of the doctrines and you have a um, generic fight on death, which again, a very, very powerful thing to have access to. Um, and what that basically does is you can run your favorite set of marine data sheets and over the course of the game you will be able to make all of them do something a little extra if you want to have you want to make that land raider go away a gladiator lancer with storm of fire for plus one ap to ignore cover does not give a land raider a save it's ap5 ignore cover you have wow. to armor of contempt to get a six up amazing um <laughs> the same thing so like votan land fortresses for the yeah season, yeah yeah right um you almost always just you just pick a thing it goes away for a cp if you're willing to spend in that turn you have um, Lance plus one AP to make any melee unit punch significantly above its weight. This was very popular with Deathwing Knights. It's now, um, I would say, things like Wolfen, Thunderwolf Cavalry, um, Death Company, um, anything that's sort of like in that general sphere of data sheet that wants to hit but has a little bit of an AP gate, giving it plus one to wound and, and plus one AP, keep pushing to AP3, AP2 on that volume is incredible you just do mm. so much damage you have reactive moves to get back into transports if you're playing with stuff that's playing out of impulsors or land raiders um gladius just does everything and there are like i don't, I don't have like a specific build for gladius in mind but there are you i would say so many different you can things run, can't you yeah um so jack templars is kind of the classic that's the Black <laughs> gladius build that jack harpster was playing which is somewhere in the region of an aggressor brick with the apothecary biologist three squads of sword brethren in impulsors um, a land raider to put the aggressors, in, the the um, eradicators inside of, and then some small scoring units like scouts, maybe a Calidus. You mm-hmm. have um, space wolves who can run um, somewhere between zero and thirty wolfen, who are just an incredibly powerful on raid data sheet. And then you have like small MSU Thunderwolf cavalry units because you can free strat. Uh, the lance and lethal is a battle tactic, or sorry, lance mm-hmm. plus one AP is a battle tactic. So mm-hmm. um, wolf lords combined with three Thunderwolves are like little chosen units. They just throw That's out, great. put them in advance and charge. They go in, they hit pretty hard, they die. Well, they weren't that expensive um or you can go heavier you can run like a full eight man with all of the shenanigans that has reactive moves and plus one and the blood surge move to move into combat with your people so you just trap them in and then you have all of the core marine shooting elements like um fire discipline which is the uh, sustained hits and critical fives and devastator doctrine turn that makes you know usually either aggressors or eradicators just go absolutely hog wild on damage output yeah. in the devastator doctrine turn they will kill like six aggressors with that with that with that enhancement will kill magnus yeah um yeah, yeah. which is just a wild amount of damage but with both at the moment yeah. um eradicators can split fire and kill two tanks fairly confidently yeah um you have then sort of like the general back, back suite of uh gladiator lancers predators whirlwinds reapers like all of the marine shooting elements work completely well in this statue because you have access to fall back and shoot you have access to advance and shoot you're very good at just getting them into position uh, there's there's nothing that isn't at least okay in gladius i don't think there's any data sheet that i'd be like oh, i wouldn't run that in gladius mm-hmm. um and then you have all the things like um like the core sort of marine data sheets of scouts um which become pretty interesting with that attachment because you can advance in action with them without having to run shotguns on them or you can fall back and do your action in the deployment zone with double homers you have the jump intercessors that can get um access to some strategies so you like there are so many cool things you can do in the attachment um mm-hmm. you know and there are some wild, like wildly cool data sheets in all of the marine like supplements that work really well with it. You have, you know, Death Company. You have Ragnar Blackmane, um, who is uh, it gives you permanent advantage charge and just hits like a truck uh, in an assault intercessor squad with it. Like you know, there's just so much cool things you can do in space marine. So many like little niche data sheets that Gladius just says every single one of them has something you can do in Gladius. Amazing. And I think you can build, like, it's really easy to build a bad Gladius list, but it's really hard to build an unplayable one. Um, you can build a Gladius list that just like doesn't have a direction, but if you go into it and you're like, right, these are good data sheets and played competently and you run it well, 
there is very little you can't do with Gladius. Yeah. Now, is it as specialized? No, you're definitely paying no. like you're paying points for flexibility, right? You are losing out on raw power. But if you can use every single turn of your doctrines and stratagems to full effect, you can like you can have one unit microdose that power. Um, <laughs> it's just making sure that you're getting the most out of that one unit and that ultimate moment every turn. Gladius is probably one of the most like resource management intensive armies. Yes. Um, and it does a really good job of it. The other kind of mixed arms one to very quickly touch on is Firestorm. Oh, um, yeah. Which just yeah. has broadly, Firestorm gives you assault and plus one strength within six for range, uh, within 12 for ranged weapons. It's very good at just getting things up the board and getting in your opponent's face. It has a plus one to wound stratagem that is what you have to be within six of your target. So it's it works well for short range shooting, like Inceptors, or very cool, or um, any melee unit is quite good with it. Mm. Um, but it's good for getting things like um, Death Company with Inferno Pistols go up to strength nine so they can threaten Rhinos a little easier. You have. Um, Things like the Land Raider Redeemer going to strength 7, Eradicators going to strength 10. It just helps with punching up into a lot of targets. Yeah. Um, we've seen some people in the UK um, playing it with reasonable success. It's one of those detachments that I think it's always just going to play second fiddle because you're. it's just kind of not as good at being mixed arms as Gladius, not as good at being yes. pure shooting as Iron Storm, but it definitely falls somewhere in the middle. And I don't think there's... There, there are compelling reasons to play it. It has cool things. Yes. Um, if Inceptors hadn't gone up 10 points I, or 20 points, I would probably still be like like strongly considering it yeah but i think inceptors getting hit was uh because of vanguard more than anything else was a big blow to this detachment because they benefit so strongly from everything it does yeah um but it's definitely one to keep an eye on it's also i think probably the best way to play death watch so if you're desperately hey. trying to play death watch give it a shot uh, i think it's <laughs> the most interesting way to approach them oh that's they have a bunch very of interesting that can definitely get there with a little bit of support and the watchmaster gives you um advance and charge to go with all the advance and shoot so things yes. like Proteus Kill teams can get really far with the board and have um, like strength eight on all of those track cannons helps them get like helps them actually punch up into a lot of things. That's so a great. It's spot. a place I would look. I don't think it makes Death Watch good, but no. it's the best place to play them. So if you're just <laughs> desperate, uh, I would play Firestorm. Stop playing. That's a wonderful little up. hint. Yeah, I, I had a soft spot for Firestorm. I remember when the when the book came out. I I liked the suite of tricks in there. I was like, people are going to have a lot of fun with this. I don't. It doesn't have quite the juice or the lift of some of the other ones. But as you say, there definitely is game in there, and there's a nice combination of tools. It's I just... think it's missing an AP stratagem, is what yes. it really feels like. Yeah. Where Gladius has the plus one strength and AP has the plus one uh, AP for shooting and combat stratagem. Firestorm doesn't, and mm. for Marines, a lot of where you get gate it is AP um, because they're generally quite low outside of exactly eradicators, even in melee um and firestorm just doesn't really help you with that it's yeah. very good at getting you to the wound roll but if your opponent has armor contempt you're like there's not a lot of ways you can punch up with it outside of exactly the flame or devastating wound stratagem that kind of locks you into playing something like aggressors that are not the most flexible and are again quite expensive for the sins of vanguard completely all right okay wonderful i mean anything else on the builds or should we start thinking about where the future's heading and where the kind of suite of units falls as we go towards no the i think like... that's like that's broadly the interesting attachments there are definitely there are other things in space right like i i constantly live in fear that one day someone's just going to make one of the attachments that i like said was terrible on a show would be great um <laughs> i read my review of sons of sanguinius that i did for like prepping for wtc and i was like wow i was very wrong <laughs> <laughs> so, i live in constant fear of that uh hey, it was right somebody's gonna play then. the saga <laughs> build and i'm just gonna be like god damn it why is this winning events now i'll have to go and learn it um but yeah um for 10 i was strongly considering bringing first company task force and then they got rid of the deathwing command squad data sheet no uh -huh, no no i will never touch it um <laughs> so yeah that's uh it's interesting. There, there is, there is cool stuff in there is cool stuff in Space Marines. It, it does have a lot of build diversity. Yeah. Um, but no, I'm more than happy to move on to data sheets and other things. Yeah. So let's let's think about the units. I mean, you, you were interested in sort of some of the, the the maybe the sleeper data sheets. Obviously, there's a lot of the known entities as well that I think we've touched on a lot. But let's let's talk about that first and sort of the spread of units and where where you think where you think the staples are and where you think it might be going, and then we'll think about the data. For sure. So I think. If I was just like, hey, what units should I pick up to start yes. collecting a Marines collection, right? I think you're going to have the very basic, you should probably own like two of the Gladiator variants. And then I would ideally you should magnetize them or be an idiot like me and just own five. Um, between the Gladiator <laughs> and the Lan between the Reaper and the Lancer, they are just very competent. But only two or three of those will never do you wrong. Uh, I think for the same reason, a couple of Impulsors, they're just good, flexible transports. Like Rhinos are good this edition for the same reason probably a couple of rhinos and that's kind of like i would say your vehicle suite get like six of those between the set and you'll have all the vehicles you'll ever need and then probably a land raider redeemer if you want to play marines like having access to it and being able to if you're playing on wc boards maybe maybe not but on any other terrain set um you can definitely consider it it's We've incredible seen playing three of them on uktc boards i would say the land raider redeemer is it's just one of those good data sheets it does 
it transports well. It shoots perfectly competently. It has terrifying Overwatch. Yeah. Just very strong data sheet. As far as units go, I think um, you're probably going to want like two scout squads. Um, I would say two squads of assault instead of jump packs. They're yes. just a very flexible unit that has really nice. all the right keywords and the right movement. You get a power fist. Like if you're playing a melee focused attachment, they're incredible with any kind of output buff. They just take buffs really well. Uh, otherwise, they're 85 point scoring units that do some more wounds, and you're never going to be upset to have them. Yeah. A little bit more pricey than scouts, but they do a very different job and have a bit more durability. Um, I would say probably six aggressors, six eradicators. Those are probably take or leave depending on detachment, but they're the kind of units that most builds will at least strongly benefit from. Um, and then five infiltrators. You get they come in box of ten, just get ten um, infiltrators. They they come and go depending on the meta a little bit. I think they're probably a little bit on the way out right now like we're not seeing them a ton because armies like hypercrypt and gray knights are attacking you with like the 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 three inch drop and the nine inch deep strike and all that mm. but they're usually capable of dealing with that kind of unit if you deploy them aggressively and they're not usually that worried about attacking your home field or if they're attacking your home field it's going to be with something that you, you're not going to stop with infiltrators it's gonna be like the void dragon is back there the infiltrators are not winning that fight yeah, like yeah. they need additional support and they can be fine but they're you know they're take or leave in the meta at the moment Mm. With Gene Circle Codex on the horizon and things like that, um, you know, I'm sure Alpha Legion are going to have an Uppy Downy detachment. For oh, some surely, yeah, hundred percent. Uppy Downy Obliterate. Downy, let's go. No, no, Downy, Uppy Downy Forge Fiends. That's what we all want. In our life, right? um, the, the, you may see them come back around um, again, plus or minus the Phobos Librarian that gives them effectively loan operative, a very, very like competent little combination, but expensive at 175 points. Um, after that, it starts getting into like, uh, oh, and probably Six Inceptors. They're on the way out right now, but that data sheet is just too wildly good to not like at least be remotely viable. Yes. That's probably the stuff that I would like baseline start with. Yeah. Then start looking at directions after that. If you want to go more into the tanks and stuff, more gladiators, predator destructors are a very good data sheet just yeah. on rate. Um if you want to go more into the melee stuff, start looking at the like specific data sheets from chapters. Yeah. Death Company, Thunderwolves, um, mm. Sword Brethren and the characters support them. Um but yeah, that's kind of like the, I would say the baseline stuff. Yeah, There's also, cool. people are not playing the Whirlwind, and I don't get it. I goddamn love that thing. Definitely Every list still I play good, that right? to shoot, I want yeah. a Whirlwind. It's just, I, I I view it as paying 80 points to make my infiltrators have a gun, and then I yeah. just leave them on my home objective, and I'm like, oh, I would pay 80 points for that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the Whirlwind has definitely been on the way out. I still think there's a play in three, but I refuse to do it because I'm saving it for WTC. Um, <laughs> he said lying. Um, oh, and the Redemptive Dreadnought is probably also worth considering in there. Um, yes, yeah. Again, it's it's just a data sheet that does a lot of things. I don't think it's amazing right now, but it has it has merit. It's quite good at the court, which helps a ton. Yeah. Um, very good at just bullying like Wraith squads. If yeah. you can catch them as they move away from you, as fast <laughs> yeah. as you move. Yeah. But yeah, same kind of thing. Yeah, I think that's Marines. And then, yeah, all the chapter stuff. You could, you can spiral into like infinite and infinite dimensions on yeah. which chapter units do you want to play. It's really just where you want to go, right? What, well, what do you want to play? Yeah. That that kind of stuff there is the stuff that I would, if I was going to try and play Space Marines for this edition, that's the stuff I would start with and then adapt from there based on games yeah. and then add characters to taste. Your characters are almost always based on detachment, whereas yeah. the baseline units tend to be fairly specific. Completely. Yeah. And setting yourself up to be able to go in those different directions seems to be key, I think, in 10th edition. So, yeah, definitely highly recommend it. But the core, as you say, can definitely still function. So, let's get our, let's get our, sort of scrying eyes on and try and think about where we're going because uh this is something i'm sure you'll you'll have a much keener eye on than myself but obviously we, we know we've got a data slate coming before long there'll be some kind of adjustments on points and marines with the range that they have the size the range of models there's always going to be things that move so if you were speculating what sort of things might you anticipate and where might what, what sort of sleeper hits might there be down the line with a few changes here and there yeah for sure um i think the immediate concern for like baseline marines above, above anything else is that you don't have great melee presence yeah so my kind of general note that any melee unit that goes down like at all is worth having a look at again mm -hmm. so jump intercessors i think are they weren't super popular for a while i definitely think they could have been on the radar for like a small change um they're they're still only like they're only amazing in sons of sanguinius really but they're good in everything else mm -hmm. and i think that's the kind of unit that if you wanted to just give marines a little bit of a bump they would just replace scouts in a lot of builds um, mm. with like a little bit of, you would trim some stuff to increase them to scouts. Um, they're only 85 points. I don't think it would be much of a change, but they're the kind of unit that if they changed at all would definitely be like, I would probably run three of them in most builds if they were you know anything less than 85 and mm -hmm. I would consider it 85. So mm -hmm. just keep an eye on that unit. Mm -hmm. I think other melee units that could change, the main one is Blackguard Veterans. Um, yes. Blackguard are really expensive for not a lot of reason right now. And mm -hmm. I think they could, they could stand to see like a pretty significant points drop. I always have this thing where, 
whenever GW make changes, I want them to just like go almost too far, but not like like I think you could drop Lygar down to like seventy points for three. They're like ninety right now. I think mm. they could be cheaper. Realistically, they could probably be sixty, and yeah. they would also be okay. You still mm-hmm. can't put six and a character in a transport um, that isn't a land raider uh, or a repulsor because their uh, impulsor only holds uh, seven, uh, holds six, not seven. Mm. So they're quite hard to support. They encourage you to play big transport or to play them on foot. And I think that data sheet would be an interesting thing for Marines to just have access to on rate. They should also probably hit on twos. Come on, GW. Um, but yeah, any any melee unit that like catches anything just gives Marines an option that they're kind of struggling with right now. Mm. Um, so I think anything that sees that at all. Then anything that goes down like 20% just in general, Marines should consider. Because as I said, Marines are really good at making a thing do its job for one thing. And yeah. if there's anything that just catches a buff and becomes slightly too like slightly too efficient, Marines are really good at taking that slight inefficiency and making it just way too going. efficient. Yeah, yeah. Um, so any unit that catches like a significant point change, I I so hope it's the Stormhawk Interceptor because I bought shares in that um, <laughs> because uh, it was really interesting coming into WCW and it's been nowhere since then. Yeah. Um, but I think that data sheet is like one of the ones that you know a little bu- a little buff here. The aircraft mechanics are very powerful. Towering is really good. Shockingly, yeah. Um, but yeah, any data sheet that comes down twenty percent is probably just Gladius can make it do something, or it'll be wild in Ironstorm. Fire Strike yeah. Servo Cars would be wild if Iron if they were like twenty points cheaper than they are. You'd run mm. six in Ironstorm every time. <laughs> um, that's that's the like the knife edge that Marine data sheets play on, right? Once you're yeah, yeah. because there's so many things in every slot, you only play the best one. So the second that something becomes slightly better than the best one, the list just improves completely. Um, which is a very it's very different than giving something a new role, which is why I think the melee is a safer place to approach that. I don't think we need marine vehicle or shooting buffs, and I don't think it should happen. Um, <laughs> and then, yeah, there's a few units in sort of like the general, like, additional sphere of things. So I think Sangre Guard are unplayable right now at 37 points a model. Oh, but if they yeah. came down a bit, they'd be really interesting. Yeah. Um, or 30, they're 175 for five, and it's ridiculous. That is nice, um, yeah. I think Vanguard Veterans would be an interesting thing to with least look. Again, they're really good in Sons of Sanguinius. Completely. Um, but that unit would be perfectly competent in a bunch of other detachments. I tried yeah. them in Death Watch. They were interesting enough. Um, there, there's a lot of things that, you know, and Sons of Sanguinius School throws a lot of problems in here when I'm like out here begging for Marine melee buffs, sitting here like, yeah, with my Blood Angels army that I've just played at three tournaments, um, <laughs> feeling like a complete hypocrite. Like, yeah, I, I, need, buff, I, need, I need Marine melee buffs. Yeah. Blood Angels do not need Marine melee buffs. No. We shouldn't hold the rest of the army hostage because, Marine, <laughs> because Blood Angels happen to have too much strength value. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah there, there's also stuff like the Predator Destructor is insane at 130, and is, mm-hmm. I think it's definitely more popular in builds like CSM and Death Guard, but yes. I think it's pretty likely to see a change up the way, and I think Marines just might follow as a result of keeping all of those profiles yeah, the same. Yeah, quite possibly. Yeah. Um, the Land Raider, I think, is definitely on the chopping block. Black Templar's vehicles in general, probably on the chopping block for yes. some generations. Yes. So I think there's a few things that we're likely to see change upwards in trajectory, and Marines are not sitting in a great place like overall meta consideration wise yeah. i think they're sitting somewhere like somewhere between like 42 and 47 percent win rate depending on the week and definitely need some help on aggregate even if specific builds don't and that always makes brown and Marines a challenge because you have to like you have to balance them for the top end which yeah. means i think the way to the way that i would be approaching it if i was gw is give them more options but don't increase power level so yeah. hit the things that are not good but not good in roles that nobody that nobody else is that, that aren't being used right now to yes. introduce more options without giving specifically the idea of like iron storm having an extra vehicle gives me the fear um so (laughs) don't hit you know don't give don't make a vehicle that's you know unplayable into something that's too cheap but if the vindicator came down 30 points and it replaced the gladiator lancer i don't think that would that would increase diversity without increasing power level yeah completely um i think that's how i would approach it but it, it's a knife edge with marines it's, it's a really tough book to balance because it, oh, has, it contains multitudes right it's too many books to be yeah. ever consider, considered as one and you have to hit for the worst the strongest ones yeah absolutely and that, that i think is, is is both pause for concern but also i think it's it's why i think marines will inevitably come out of the slate with exciting stuff going on because it always happens right it's just, and that that range and that depth and that flexibility that we've kind of alluded to across the episode i think that's that's the real strength that's what they've got going for them and it's going to be very interesting to see what sort of different directions sort of benefit from or, or suffer from the changes and ho- hopefully it opens up a few new options going forward oh it would be almost impossible for it not to like yeah there are <laughs> it's like so what many, can they do <laughs> there are so many good data sheets in this book yeah um yeah if you've if you've never tried playing ragnar Blackmane and five yes as an impulsor or with six blade guard and rapid ingress yeah um that he is so good yeah if you've never like seen the seen a turn of um you know 
uh, there's some, there's some cool stuff even in Blood Angels that's not been super explored. Like, um, there's a character called um, Tycho the Lost who gets yes. in charge to his squad, and him with ten additional foot death company, like in a like you could put him and ten inside a rhino, put the ten with the chapel inside a land raider, and then suddenly the land raider drives forward twelve, dive discords the squad. Tycho <laughs> jumps out of the other one, advance and charges, and you're just like here is twenty death company. They're all gonna fight on death, and you can do that in any detachment. Like yeah. you can do that in Firestorm where they all get plus one um, plus one strength on their inferno pistols. You can yes. and assault with the shoot with them. You can do that in Gladius with like that. That's almost a attachment agnostic you could play that in iron storm if you really wanted to you could yeah the, all predators they're right there saying please give me rerolls um <laughs> i love that data sheet as well so yes yeah like there will be changes for marines coming there they will be suck for some builds but iron storm is probably not going anywhere that attachment is too efficient no. i can't imagine some sanguinius being hit particularly hard because no. it's new novel and cool and it also it's one of those armies that you put it on the table and it looks like it's just come out of a white dwarf and you're all yes. you're like, oh, okay, cool. So this that's, is the thing. That's GW the absolute wants dream. Good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, GW, yeah. you know, GW just like rubbing their hands together. The idea that like space marines and transports with flat backed up by some by like four tanks is the, <laughs> is a great build right now. They're yeah. like, oh my god, we nailed it. We did it. We, we did it, boys. We managed <laughs> it. This was the dream. Yeah. This is what we the, the rhinos, predators, and land raiders edition. It's so yeah. confusing. <laughs> it's crazy. It's a very weird time. It's, like, it's literally it's a it's a window into when I came into the game because I literally came into the game at a point where all the things that my sort of post like teenage brain would go, oh, obviously I'm going to get these. Everyone's telling me they're garbage. And now suddenly for the first time playing the game, it's like, oh, it's the classic tanks. It's, it's, it's all the, it's all the old stuff. We're doing it. <laughs> yeah. I put, um, it's actually kind of like that for a lot of builds right now. I think GW did a really good job of increasing, I agree. Yeah. like outside of a couple of specific skewers, Grey Knights. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, the most builds look like generally like Warhammer armies Completely. now, which I think is cool. Um, I put um, John Lennon's Euro Trash Territories list on the board, which is just like thirty gargoyles and like a sea of monsters. And I'm like, yeah. this is perfect. This is yeah. exactly what I wanted out. Of exactly. Yeah. No, completely. I, th I think that's right. I think the the list design and, and the the balance of lists is is really in a really cool spot. And so I'm, that's one of the aspects of Tenth I am really enjoying. Okay, Ennis, I mean, I think considering the ground you had to cover, you've absolutely smashed that for time. And I'm very, very impressed that we got we got that close to an hour. Thank you so much for coming on. It's been an absolute treat to get the download, as always. Um, so that people might be able to find and access this wonderful brain in other places, you want to just reiterate where, where they can find you and where, yeah, when you're so, broadcasting? Uh, the, main, the main two places, um, youtube.com slash stat check. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, every Tuesday at 11 p.m. UK time. We go live for somewhere between an hour and a half and four hours, usually two, um, <laughs> for the usual stat check. That's us covering um, like the most recent week in uh, for in metadata, mm -hmm. any events we've been at, and then just generally vamping on the state of Warhammer right now. Um, there's also a bunch of other shows on the network that are super awesome, but I'm not going to check them out right now. Mm -hmm. um, but go check that out. Or you can check out stat-check.com for everything else we do. That's got all of the um, the metadata dashboard, which has all of the stats and things like that that I've been alluding to over the course of the episode. It's got um, our articles and all that kind of thing on there. So mm -hmm. if that's something you're interested in, check either of those out. It would be greatly appreciated. Uh, also, you can just drop me a message on Discord. I'm uh, just Innis Wilson. Um, if you want to reach out and speak about anything, just drop me a message. I'm always happy to chat. Amazing. Wonderful. Okay. Well, yeah, can't recommend stat check enough. So do go and check that out. Um, Ines, thank you so much. And thank you to all Tom, of you, you listeners. Tom, you do your plugs. Come oh, on. I've got to do my plugs. Oh, <laughs> goodness. I'm not as good at plugs as you. Don't forget that we are 6++. Plus plus. Do hit like and subscribe. We love that good stuff. Leave us a comment. Let us know um, what kind of Space Marine things have been working for you. I would love to hear that. And you can, of course, sign up to be a member on our YouTube and support us that way as well. And what, what data sheet do you most want to get buffed? Come on, call to action. Get it in the comments. Yes. Yeah. What data sheet would you like to see buffed? What Marine build? Is it going to be Anvil somehow coming back? Is it's Firestorm with Dominic the entire method. <laughs> buff them. <laughs> More buffs for Gladiator Reapers. My elves need to die even quicker than just, they already do. Gladiator Reapers should go back to being 24 shots and not twin links. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's what not? I need. Let's have it. Let's just have tons and tons. Actually, they need a third type of Black Templars Gladiator Reaper to bring in so that we can finally yeah. hit, the, hit the heights of nine. My, my favorite thing is you could build a competent five-man teams event out of just Black Templars list right now. <laughs> uh, don't worry about that statement. <laughs> that's, a, that's a teams event someone needs to host. I'm here for it. I think you, right. you used to build ones where you didn't have faction requirements. You could so you could just play like four different like you have just four people in the same imperial fist gun line i think they should bring that back just show up with black templars righteous crusaders iron storm oh, gladius so and firestorm a true like, yeah let's go yeah that's amazing <laughs> four hellbrecks leading four detachments it's just different <laughs> timelines of the same crusade as you can see guys there is a risk me and this will just keep talking for ages Absolutely. so i'm i am going to sign off now but loads of love to you all we'll see you again next time bye bye <laughs>